Hello. Ha. Ah. How are you guys doing today? So um, my name is John Yi. I'm a cloud solutions architect uh, at Rackspace. And today I'm going to talk about service orchestration with Docker and CoreOS. So I believe that this is actually uh, sort of a, an important topic, obviously, for me, but uh, for the community at large, because I think that what's going to happen is all our applications are increasingly uh, composed of web services. And eventually, what will happen is we're going to have a lot more services to manage, which means we have to figure out a way to automate all this. And while Chef, SaltStack, Ansible, Puppet can help us manage it, I don't think they alone can manage uh, doing service orchestration. So, I want to go ahead and start with the story. It's uh, the green cookie. So our story starts with the green cookie. It's a startup. And as you guys can tell, uh, this is what they make. Not very appetizing. So um, they only really actually see sales um, St. Patty's Day, maybe Christmas. So things for green cookies is kind of ho-hum. Uh, not much activity. So consequently, their, uh, their uh, IT infrastructure is fairly modest. They don't really need very much. Um, it's just a simple old LAMP stack, right? Uh, and this is sufficient for what they're doing because they don't have really any customers, right? Oh, then one day. So, they started seeing sales increase in these regions in the U.S. You know, the dark green, Montana, California, Maine. Now, these two states, Washington State and Colorado, they started seeing an enormous increase. <laughs> they weren't sure what was going on, right? They are like, this is kind of weird. So, the CEO of uh, Green Cookies, met with the sales and marketing folks. They want to figure out what's going on. Why are we seeing such a huge increase in sales? And it didn't take them long to figure out what was going on. So what they decided is they're going to focus on Washington and Colorado State, right? Because they figured, why not go ahead and hit the, uh, uh, strike the iron while it's hot, right? So in addition uh, to you know, delivering cookies to those states, they uh, slipped a little something extra. So this is their strategy. And it was brilliant. <laughs> Sales went through the roof, right? They, they were like, it was like, it's startup time, right? So their startup had hit somewhat the big time, and they were increasing sales a lot. However, you remember that trusty old lamp stack that they had? That wasn't scaling well at all. So it was, uh, it was falling over a lot. And they needed to actually do something about that. So the first thing they decided to do is uh, they gave the elephants in the room peanuts and told them to walk. And then a new group of developers came in, the Java dudes, right? So the Java dudes decided, you know, I know what we need to do to write the ship here. We know what, what the infrastructure needs. And so they re-architected it, or they basically promised these things, performance, scalability, manageability, reliability. And so they re-architected it. Congratulations, they brought green cookies back into the 2000s, right? Because this is pretty traditional. So everything a growing business needed, they were, they were doing pretty well. And the business just started to grow. And what happens when business start to grow? Well, there are all these different requirements. Um, then all these services are being asked. So they started needing to actually do something in terms of their app. They needed to add some additional components to it. So they started, uh, they started integrating this into their uh, main Java app. And you know, they called these components. And for them, the definition was it's a individual unit of software that can be upgraded and in terms of this app, that wasn't exactly true. So these components actually lived inside the main process of the Java app, and there were issues, which we'll see in just a second. So over a period of time, you know, the development process starts to, starts to continue, and 
you know, there are interdependencies, all these shared libraries between these different components. The search depended on like the mail app and the auth depended on data and like the data depended on all these components and the auth basically was needed by all the components. So there are all these sort of interdependencies. And some of it was, you know, necessary. Some of it was just shared code. Some of it was just libraries that they were sharing. Sometimes search would share a library that auth needed. And what you're seeing right now is sort of this creeping in effect of all the different sort of like areas of maybe the main Java app and the different things that are happening as the development process is coming along. So let's see. Now you can't see this as clearly, but they also had other issues. For example, let's say they wanted to upgrade their data component. I, I try to make that clear, but it's not showing up as much. They wanted to basically upgrade their data component, but they couldn't just upgrade that single uh, component. They had to basically upgrade everything else. They had to basically rebuild, redeploy, do everything that that, that app had because they were all tied together. There was no easy way to actually break them out. Scaling became an issue, right? So let's say, for example, they wanted to scale the search component. Well, it's part of this main app. So if they wanted to scale the search component, they scaled everything. That included auth, data, mail, the main Java app. And the issue, of course, is maybe those applications or those components don't need all the resources that they're asked to actually use or consume. So this became an issue. And on top of all that, they're a growing company. And with growing companies, that means you need to find talent. And sometimes they're not Java developers. Sometimes there's Gopher here, Pythonista. You've got the Ruby guys. So all of a sudden, you had all these different components. They're all part of this one app. And they were trying to figure out, how do we, how do we make this all work together? And so they're kind of looking at this, right? They're saying, hey. How do we separate out all these different components? And how do, we, how do we make this all interact with each other? And of course, the answer was simple. Make web services out of them, right? So uh, I'm using the term microservices. I know that has um, a little bit of a uh, story past, but I think that's the most accurate description of this. And essentially, with the uh, web services, uh, you have a decoupling of all the different components. You don't have to worry as much about all the different integration points within the main Java app. It just simply calls the web service. And to a certain extent, OpenStack is the same way. It has a bunch of web services or projects to make that work. So this looked like a pretty brilliant idea for them. Now, you've got like a Python, a Gopher, right? You got the gem. Gem's really popular with the ladies, right? They go out to this party, right? And so they're sitting there kicking back, and they're basically mingling. And they meet this whale, right? This whale is just saying crazy stuff. What is, what's the whale saying, right? Saying, hey, there's a Unix philosophy that I believe in, and I think I can deliver something for you guys that does the same things. We've got these things called containers, do one thing well, right? You can take a bunch of these containers and compose an application out of it. And then finally, you can even use this thing called linked containers. It's almost like a Unix pipe. So he went, pulled out a napkin, and he drew this. Basically, we've got an app service. It has a, a it has a data store on the back end. And within the same Docker container, uh, they link the containers. And in a lot of ways, there's a lot of similarities with how you might use Unix to pipe it to another command. And so they also kind of, he also kind of talked about uh, the ambassador container. How do, you, how do you get this to actually talk to other services across other Docker instances? He called this uh, cross-host linking, right? So essentially, you have this ambassador container whose sole job is to essentially provide the connection, to route a connection to another service. You have an app service that says, hey, I have a dependency, and the ambassador basically helps along with that process. So the operations guys, they were loving this, right? They started seeing sort of the potential of what, what can be done here, right? They liked the idea that there's this nice, neat container, and they didn't have to worry about all the packaging and all the things that went inside that. They were super psyched about it. So they kind of looked at it in terms of, hey, on the left-hand side, we've got the build. These are where the developers live. On the right-hand side, that's essentially where we live, right? 
We make the pipes and everything else uh, fit together to actually go and run this. And as long as the container has all of the developer's mess and we are on our side doing our operations thing, everything is good. So the, you know, the operations guys were loving this. They liked that there was a clean separation between what the developers might do and what they might do. And they could also add some additional infrastructure with containers. So they did what any startup would do. They went and used a, a non-production ready <laughs> technology and they implemented it in, into production, right? I mean, wouldn't you guys do the same? You're a startup, man, come on, right? You make green cookies for crying out loud. Anyway, so this is their sort of like, their web service. So they're running it in the Docker container. About this time, they started running with this for a little while and you know, that's the thing about new technology. When you, start, when you start fiddling with it and you start using it, you start to get to know some of its downfalls. And what they kind of discovered is, well, some of their Docker instances looked very much like this air traffic control map, right? There are containers all over the place. Now, how do you manage all of this stuff? And they started really kind of thinking about this and they're like, well, we have these web services. Surely, surely someone else is doing the same thing. So they looked around. Maybe they talked to Rackspace, uh, maybe they talked to AWS, maybe they talked to uh, Netflix, Airbnb, some of the other folks that are out there that are managing services. And they came out with three sort of fundamental things about being able to do surface orchestration. First, they discovered that there needs to be some sort of central registry. And generally, the central registry looks like a file system, except it has on its nodes some configuration information. So the idea is when there is a service, so here we've got our app service and our registry client, when it needs to publish config information, it simply says, hey, I'm all right over here. And he says, well, I need to go and talk to the central registry to let who else might be interested know that. So he does that. And of course, there's an app client at the other end of this. The app client says, hey, where's data one? And the app client then connects to the, the data service. It's fairly simple, right? Fairly easy concept to grasp. So essentially, in a nutshell, that's service orchestration. So around this time, they're like, you know, they're kind of running with Docker, everything's going good. And, you know, they're a startup, so what do they do? They go out, and this doesn't show up very well, but they went to a rave, right? What do you do at raves? I don't know. Maybe they had some green cookies. Maybe they had some other things, right? Well, the thing is, they, they got pretty, pretty hammered, pretty sloshed. One of them was sitting on the street somewhere, right? And he sees this pass by. And the gopher says, Psst, hey. So the gopher begins to tell him, you know what you should do? You should run your Docker instances in CoreOS. So the gopher was basically giving him some tips here. And he said, hey, First of all, you know that central registry thing that you're kind of, kind of you know, battling back and forth in your mind? Well, we've got that. We've got this thing called etcd. And not only that, each instance of CoreOS can be clustered, so they share the same data store. So let's take a look at that service registration piece again, right? So I've got, I got a data service and a service registration container. Now, the service registration container handles that function alone. The only thing it ever does is it says, hey, I see that there's a service, I'm gonna publish it for it. And what's really neat about this is you're decoupling the service registration piece from the actual app. The data service is unaware of any of this stuff. So he publishes where he's at. The app client has another, let's call it a sidekick, has a sidekick. It's a service discovery container. It says, hey, where's, my, where's, where's data one? And so the application client can then ask that and he can get that information. Now the application client obviously didn't ask that because it doesn't know, but the service discovery container handled that piece for it. So the application client can now connect to data one. So this is uh, off of CoreOS's website. You know, this actually shows a little bit about um, how everything is kind of put together, although in this particular case, we'll go through the load balancing container, but. 
there's one other thing that the gopher was kind of mentioning. You know, he's like, hey, on top of all of that cool stuff, there's also this thing called Fleet. It's a great project, right? He said, well, what can you do with Fleet? Well, say, for instance, that you have an instance that dies, Fleet will automatically restart the containers and the resources that are available. So for you folks that are familiar with vMotion, this kind of looks vMotion-like. But the idea here is that it automates having to even worry about failed core OS instances. It's like, wow, this is pretty awesome. So um, business is booming, it's rolling. Um, and so far, we kind of talked about microservices. We talked a little bit about implementing Docker for these web services. Um, we talked a little bit about service orchestration. And we've got Kiana here. So the next part of the story is about uh, a cookie monster, right? Because I, I want to be clear, this is not the cookie monster, it's a cookie monster. And apparently this cookie monster was out there one Saturday night, and he's loving this company, Green Cookies. He decides he loves it so much he's going to tweet it to all his followers. And this cookie monster, th this a cookie monster, or this cookie monster, had a lot of followers. So they had this single point of failure, essentially. It was a single low balancer on their services. And um, it's a Saturday night. All his followers go and hit it. And of course, it goes down. It goes down dramatically. Now, keep in mind, all the orange uh, components, they don't have any issues whatsoever. It's just this load balancer that had the issue. So they have this sort of problem, right? Needless to say, the, the, the DevOps guys, they, they're really unhappy. They, they try calling the developers. They didn't know what was going on. You know, it was a big mess. And what happens on a Monday morning? You know, like the developer rolls in. He says, hey, how was your weekend? Well, I was fighting a fire. It was like our operations, our site was down, right? So what do you do? You kind of like go through uh, a triage and try to take a look at what happened and try to improve your infrastructure. So that's what they did. And they, they took a look at that single point of failure, you know, that maybe that could be a middle tier or a group of load balancers. You know, they thought of different things. Maybe we could, you know, have dual load balancers, or maybe we can do some, some scheme where we don't have to depend on one, right? Well, they went back and kind of took a look at uh, the different folks that are actually implementing microservices, and it turns out almost all of them are basically embedding the load balancing in the app client. So the app client, they figured, would have the smarts to handle this. Now, with this particular piece, and you see the registry client, that could be a container, and it could also be a container that handles the load balancing piece. And so what, what you're essentially hoping to be able to do is be able to offload some of that from your developers. So here's a, here's a client load balancing scheme. It's kind of simple here. So one of the key pieces of this is that there is a registry client, and the registry client needs to basically tell the central registry, hey, I'm alive, and he does this every, every so often to make sure that the central registry knows this. Now, what happens when a node fails? Well, when the node fails, the central registry said, I haven't received a heartbeat. I haven't received anyone refreshing the time to live. I think I'm just going to remove that entry because it must be dead, and it would be correct in this case. So the app client, always keeping the registry client updated, knowing all its list of services that are available, reroutes. And then we have this, this great scenario, right? DevOps, DevOps is a hero, right? They solved it, and they put it together. We're running now microservices, Docker, CoreOS. And that's pretty much the end. So I, uh, I did quite a bit of research, and some of the links that I found really helpful if you're interested in this topic is um, Eureka. Obviously, those folks actually uh, wrote up quite a bit. Airbnb has SmartStack, and then you've got uh, you know, the Docker, Docker documentation. And CoreOS has a blog about doing exactly what I kind of described. So that's it. Any questions? A question: the, the re, Can you go back one slide? Because sure. Or there we go. So you were saying the client uh, registry is sending heartbeats for the particular service. Oh, I'm sorry. That is what they call. So I didn't want to get too detailed, but it's yeah. a watch. 
essentially it's like a long pole. So the registry client is basically making this long pole and it'll just sit there and wait. And if the registry says, hey, something changed, you know, I, I removed a node, I added a node, right? That update would hit the registry client. It would go then say, hey, my list is updated. And then it'd go right back out and do the same thing. That's what that's supposed to represent. Yeah, I mean, the central registry is acting like a load balancer because it's getting the heartbeats from the different registry clients. Right. And when it, uh, it doesn't receive a heartbeat, it times out and pulls it out of the registry right. database. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious to know a little more details on the heartbeat. I mean, is it just a general heartbeat or is it looking at some of the key uh, aspects of those particular services? How deep is it pulling those services to know is the service truly down or is it degraded? Oh, so, pull, so in this case, uh, this, this particular example is in the case where you know you, you're, there's something called a TTL refresh. So when you create a configuration node, if you can say, "Hey, I want this to expire in I don't know a minute or something like that," right? And if you don't receive a refresh from me, remove it off the list. That's not necessarily the, no, uh, the mode that you have to put it in, but you can put it in that mode. And then what you can do is watch you know, the nodes that actually contain that configuration. So if anything were to happen, they would be able to update the list. And then in that model, it appears the central registry now becomes that single point of failure and scalability concern. Right. Do you know how to address that or how it's Yeah. Addressed? So essentially, and this was kind of hard to diagram, but because etcd is on every single instance of CoreOS, it, you always have an etcd service running on a CoreOS instance. So even if you lose that piece, it's actually not necessarily sitting as an isolated network sort of service. It's part of you know, the core OS instance that you're running on. It's just not quite shown here. In, in, in each core OS instance, there's etcd, and they're clustered together. So basically, all your core OS just become one giant central. Exactly. Any other questions? The links, yes. Was it the last slide? No. Am I going in the right direction? Which one? Uh, this is next to the last slide. Oh, right here. Sorry about that. <laughs> I thought you meant container links. Sorry. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah. What's the uh, scalability like in terms of horizontal scalability? So they have a recommendation, but they're eventually going to lift this ban. And by the way, all the stuff that we're talking about, <laughs> non-production, as you probably know, but they have this sort of idea number, or they call it the idea number, which is between three and nine. But eventually what they're hoping to do is they're eventually uh, going to let you expand this to however many. Uh, that's, their, that's their goal. Uh, so uh, right now it's uh, using the RAF protocol, and only one of them is actually, uh, when it's selected, the leader is actually making the rights, and all the rest of them are slaving off of that. Okay. Thank you. All right.